I found this garment laying on the floor, so uh, who, whoever lost it, don't tell them what I'll catch from picking it up, but there she is right there if you need it. You might need it to get on your horse when you leave here. Did everybody get one of these study sheets when you came in? If you didn't get one, just it's for the sermon, it's not for the Bible class. If you didn't get one, just raise your hand. Brother. And uh, we got some young men that'll get one to you. Uh, I think I think we have plenty of them, like for everybody to have one. You don't have to share one with your uh, whoever's with you. We got enough for everybody to have one. Just hold your hand up high. They can't see too well. The elderly people passing them out. So, uh, here's one right here, an elderly person. Uh, having some interference this morning. Maybe the mothership, I don't know. We'll see what happens. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel. In chapter 1, we have this. This thing's gone. Let's just try this one. Can everybody hear now? Can you turn it up just a little, Mark? Now, could you turn up just a little? Thank you, sir. Chapter one is an unusual chapter. You have this very unusual vision that Ezekiel receives from God. You can look on the internet and people have tried to draw it and it's, it's very difficult to draw. Uh, I admire those who have tried, it's very difficult, but it was a very unusual vision that he sees, and the vision that he sees is of the glory of God. That's hard to explain, that's why it's hard to, dry, to draw, because God's glory is so much greater than anything we have ever seen. And Ezekiel has the privilege of seeing the glory of God coming in judgment. So in chapter 1, if you notice the last verse, when, when he sees this wondrous vision and he hears this voice speaking to him, which is the voice of God, he falls to the ground with his face to the ground. Now if you notice on your study sheet here, This caused Ezekiel to be in awe of God. Great men throughout history have experienced the glory of God. In Hebrews 11 and verse number 7, one of the men that we all know from our Bible studies, a man by the name of Noah, it says, Noah moved with fear and prepared an ark to the saving of his house by which he condemned the world and became the heir of righteousness which is by faith. He moved with fear. He had an awesome respect for God. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 21, another great man by the name of Moses beheld the glory of God. And as he tries to describe that in human words, the Hebrew writer explains, Moses said, I just stood there quaking 
It was such a tremendous sight, the glory of God, that Moses could just stand there and shake. Hebrews 12, 21. That's what we have here in Ezekiel. When he sees the glory of God, he just falls to the ground with his face on the ground. Because the glory of God is such an awesome thing. And the glory of God here is talking about the glory of God who is coming in judgment. He is coming to judge his people because they have become so ungodly, so materialistic, so prideful, so much like the world that God is coming to judge them. And Ezekiel is seeing a vision of that in chapter 1. This is going to prepare Ezekiel for his call. We're talking about the call of Ezekiel from God. This is going to prepare him for his, for his call that's going to come from God. And this call is recorded in Ezekiel chapter 2 and chapter 3. Now obviously we don't have time to... In the short time we have here, we can't go over every verse, but you can read it when you get home. And there's a few little questions here, little Mickey Mouse questions on the bottom of the page to see if you understood what's in these chapters. You can fill out those questions when you get home and see if you really understood what these two chapters are all about. Let's get a general view of what happened. All right, look at your outline here on your study sheet. First of all, in chapter 1, verse 28, God speaks to the prophet and he sees this glorious vision in chapter 1, verse 28, to prepare him for what's going to come in chapter 2 and 3. In chapter 2, verse 1 through 7, God explains for this man the work that he has for him to do. And it's a glorious work. It's a wonderful work. It's a difficult work, but it's a work for God. And so the first seven verses explain in chapter 2 the work that God's going to give to Ezekiel. Now let's break that down just a little bit. Verses 1 and 2, preparation for the work. A lot of people don't seem to understand. If you're going to work for God, you need to be prepared. You need to make some preparation. And before Ezekiel is going to do God's work, he's got to be prepared. So these first two verses talk about his preparation. Notice chapter 2, verse 1. Ezekiel's got his face on the ground and the Spirit comes and lifts him up and tells him to get up. There's a great work to be done. As John Wayne would say, he's burning daylight. He needs to get up. You know, we don't need to spend all of our life in preparing. I've known people that just want to spend their whole life just going to school. Sometimes it's been preachers. I love to go to school too. But there's a time after we're prepared, we need to get up. And that's what he's telling him in verse 1 and 2. The Holy Spirit is speaking to him and saying, get up, do this work. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 21. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Spirit of God. Here we actually see that happening in Ezekiel 2, 1 and 2. In the New Testament, men went out all over the world to preach the gospel. They needed to be prepared for that great work. So Paul writes to Timothy, and here's what he tells him. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Give diligence. This is a great work. You must be diligent about this work. You must be prepared for this work. 
It's not something you just go out and shoot from the hip. It's not something that just anybody can do. There's got to be proper preparation for this beautiful work of taking God's Word. In chapter 2, verse 3 through 5, he's given an assignment. His assignment is very difficult. A person who's going to go out and work for God, they need to know what they're supposed to be doing. It's not, well, I went out and worked for God. He's given an assignment. He's told very specifically, very plainly, this is what you do. This is how you do it. So he's given his assignment in verse 3 through 5. And verse 6 through 7, he is challenged. He is challenged to do this great assignment. He is challenged to remain faithful. He's going to be preaching to these same people for over 20 years. And as he is ready, getting ready for this work, he must realize many challenges are going to come his way. He said, it's going to be like you're in briars and thorns and scorpions. The devil's going to throw many challenges in his way. The devil is going to try to discourage him any way that he can from preaching the truth, just like he does today. All faithful preachers are challenged. And the devil is constantly challenging them. Give in to this group. Give in to this person. Compromise a little here. Let up a little bit here. This individual is being offended. And they give so much to the contribution, you've got to be careful. So the devil will use anything to stop us from proclaiming his word. And Ezekiel is to understand that before he goes out. He's going to have many challenges. And he's often going to think just like Jeremiah in chapter 20 and verse 8. Jeremiah 20 and verse 8. He said, I'm not going to do this anymore. He tried it. People wouldn't listen. They mocked him. They made fun of him. They tried to kill him. And so in Jeremiah 20 verse 8, Jeremiah says, I'm not going to speak his word anymore. He had had enough. But then the next verse said, God's word was in his heart like a burning fire. And he just couldn't remain silent. And so Ezekiel is going to have to understand there's going to be many things that are going to tempt him to give up. Then chapter 2, verse 8, all the way through chapter 3, the Lord tells Ezekiel, first thing, you got to accept what I say. You're going to have to accept the words of God. And the way God explained this, he said, now listen, these people you're going to preach to, he tells him before he ever gets out there, <laughs> they're not going to accept it. God says to him, they haven't accepted me. Why do you think they'll accept what you say? They're not going to accept it. They're going to reject my words. They're not going to change their life. They don't want to be bothered. They want to be left alone. They don't want to be challenged. They don't want to repent. They don't want to change their lives. They're happy with the way things are in the present condition. They don't want to change. And Ezekiel is going to be a very, very difficult task because these people are very rebellious. You don't be like them. When you see them rejecting my word, you be sure you don't do the same thing. 
In Acts chapter two, verse 41, Jesus said on this rock, I'll build my church. Not my denomination, my church. And when Jesus built his church, look at the kind of people that made up that beautiful church in Acts 2, 41. They therefore that gladly received his word were baptized. These are the first members of Christ's church. What kind of people were they? They weren't perfect. But when they heard what God said, they just accepted it. They didn't argue about it. They didn't say, well, what about this and what about that? I've tried to do my best. Why do I have to do this? When they heard they needed to turn away from their sins and they needed to be immersed, they didn't fight with it. They didn't reject it. They obeyed it. They that gladly received his word were baptized. Acts 2.41. Then the gospel goes to Gentile people. We're Gentiles. And in Acts 10.33, Peter went to preach to these people and notice this beautiful statement, we are all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. An ideal audience, we're here to receive God's word. We don't know what it is. We don't understand what God wants us to do. But here we are, we're ready to hear it. Is that the way you are when you hear a sermon? Or are you trying to find the preacher that misses a couple of numbers where you can get him? You just trying to find something wrong? Is that, is that your whole attitude? Well, you're not going to get much out of this lesson or any other lesson than anybody preaches. If that's your whole attitude. If your attitude is not when the word of God is presented, I am ready to accept it. Whoever it is that teaches it, if it's in the Bible, that's the word of God and I'm ready to accept it and I'm ready to obey it. Now that's what God is saying to Ezekiel. First, you've got to receive my words. Then in chapter 3, verse 4 through 11, he tells him very plainly, he has a responsibility. When you go out and work for God, you have a responsibility. When Ezekiel was called by God, he had a responsibility, a dire, serious responsibility. His responsibility was to preach the word of God, to deliver God's word to these people, even though they didn't want to hear it. You remember what he told Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 7, all my words that I speak to you, you will speak them to all that I tell you to speak them to. And then Jeremiah 1 verse 9, God touched his mouth and gave him his words. Jeremiah was responsible to preach every word that God gave him, no matter who liked it, no matter who didn't, no matter who was offended, no matter who was hurt. Jeremiah was demanded to preach God's word. Same thing with Ezekiel. This is your responsibility. You have got to preach the word of God. In the New Testament we find in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 11, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, the inspired apostle gave this charge to a preacher. I charge you before God, before the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the quick of the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Verse 2, preach the word. This is not the time for us to all decide how we're going to vote in November. This is not the time to talk about all the current events that are happening around the world. This is the time that we seriously consider the Word of God. God has given us this time. We must use it wisely. Paul told the preacher, preach the Word. 
2 Timothy 4, verse 2. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heat to themselves itching ears. They will turn away their ears from the truth, and they shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, do the work of an evangelist. And what's the work of an evangelist? I don't have to ask you. I don't have to wonder about it. All I have to do is read 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. I know what it is. An evangelist is responsible, number one, to preach the Word of God just like it's found in the Bible. Not his theories, not his ideas, not it seems to me, but preach the Word. 2 Timothy 4, verse 2. That's the responsibility of Ezekiel, Titus, chapter 1. Titus, chapter 1, verse 13, Paul said to another preacher, rebuke with all authority. Why? Just to be arrogant? Just because you know more than other people? Just to show other people what all you've done and how wonderful you are? You rebuke God's people so they will be sound in the faith. Amen. Did you know that's in the Bible? Titus 1.13. In chapter 2 verse 15. Paul said to the same preacher, these things speak, exhort, rebuke with all authority. Over and over God says to Ezekiel, when you go out to these people, here's how you begin your sermon. Thus saith the Lord. Let me tell you something, brethren. When you have a thus saith the Lord in its context, not jerked out of context to make it say what you want it to mean, but when you have a thus saith the Lord for what the Lord has to say, that's authoritative. Not because I said it or because any other wonderful minister spoke it, it is authoritative because God spoke it. And that's what he tells him in verse chapter 3, verse 4 through 11. In chapter 3, 12 through 27, here is his motivation. His motivation for doing his work. He sees this vision again. This is to spur him on. The Holy Spirit speaks to him. And he is told to be a watchman. That's his motivation. God tells him, Ezekiel, you're not just a sweet little preacher for everybody to love. You are to watch out. You are to be a watchman for my people. You are to warn them when they sin, not coddle them in their sins. You are to warn them. And if you don't warn them when they sin, their blood will be on your hand. But if you warn them, their blood's on their own hands. That's a motivating factor. We find the same thing in 2 Corinthians 5, verse number 11. The motivating factor of the, Paul, the, the Apostle Paul, he said, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Knowing the coming judgment that is coming upon our world, knowing the terror of our God, preachers, preachers, 
attempt to persuade people, not force them, not intimidate them, not embarrass them to death, not put their name up for everybody to see. No, they try to persuade men to simply obey the word of truth. That's the motivating factor. We know the terror of God. The motivating factor is found in Luke 19.10 when Jesus said, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. We know how much souls are worth and we know how horrible it is to be lost. Thus we attempt to persuade people to simply accept what the Bible says. Change your life. Don't be stubborn and prideful. Repent while you still can. The time will come when you'll wish you had the time to repent and it'll be no longer. Thus we persuade men because of the terror of the Lord. What is the basic task of Ezekiel? What was his basic task? What do you think the basic task of any preacher is? Well, I think it's this. I think it's this. I think it's this. Uh Uh-huh. And I've heard that for about 50 years. But when I read the Bible, what God says, that means more to me than what any of you say. Whoever you are, whatever power you think you have, That means more to me what my God says than what any puny man has to say about it. And God says the number one task of anyone who tries to proclaim God's word, the number one task is to deliver God's message exactly as you find it in the pages of the Bible. That's number one. Now when we come and look at these people, God says to Ezekiel, listen, you preach it, whether they accept it or not. Don't be afraid of how they look at you. Don't be afraid of what they say. You'd be be surprised some of the threats I have received for preaching the truth from men who were supposed to be godly men. Threats. God tells Ezekiel, you don't be afraid of anything they say. I'm going to be with you. You preach my word regardless of whether they accept it regardless of whether they don't accept it, and then it falls upon their shoulders. We've all sinned, every one of us in this room who are accountable. Every one of us have sinned. Now, do you hear what God says about that? He doesn't say, just go out here and help people. And that'll take care of all your sins. Just go out of here and do good for people. That'll take care of all your sins. That won't take care of one sin. I don't care how many good things you've done in your whole life. Did you know that didn't take away one sin? Not even one. I don't care how many wonderful works you've done. If you've never obeyed his gospel, you are in your sins. And you will suffer in a devil's hell if you do not accept God's truth. And God's truth is that you turn away from your sins and be immersed to have those sins forgiven. Will you accept that while we stand and while we sing?